Okay, uh, well, what happened last week was that we introduced the problem of hereditary error, <coughs> but we were introduced it from the standpoint of our own political practice. What had happened was that in the course of a discussion that Lyndon LaRouche had held that morning, he had been briefed on what our intention had been as to what we were about to present to our group in New York. He objected to what uh, was going to be presented we reversed direction, changed it, and then presented that which he uh, at least uh, agreed was better than what had been planned. Now, what was the reason for the objection? Uh, it goes right to the heart of what Diane was talking about as I came in. The problem involved is that we are in a situation where evaluations and assessments that people are making will directly affect what actually happens in the world. Uh, not only our evaluations and assessments, but erroneous evaluations and assessments by all sorts of people who may perhaps not intend to do it, but may actually negatively affect the outcome of things. For example, the conference that's going on right now that's being held by these uh, neo-environmentalists and environmentalists who are against nuclear war, but they're also against nuclear power. And last week we made the, the, the observation that those who have opposed nuclear power and thermonuclear power uh, may have already condemned the entire, not only human race, but all manner of life on the planet to extinction. This may already have occurred. And the reason this may already have occurred is that as a result of recent, relatively recent, uh, astrophysical and other evidence that we've gained in the last, let's say, 10 or 15 years, we now know that there are over half a million asteroid bodies that are circling our planet and perhaps millions more. Uh, and these are in various orbits, in various uh, states of uh, motion around the Earth that we don't, we haven't charted, they're uncharted. We don't know where they're going, we don't know their trajectories. And you could only relevantly actually know these things by a very aggressive use of thermonuclear-based space exploration and space technologies. Uh, for example, uh, though this goes a little bit beyond the particulars of what we're talking here to talk about, one of the things that you could do is you could use uh, a series of thermonuclear hydrogen explosions, hydrogen bomb explosions, to backlight space. In other words, put a couple hundred hydrogen bombs out in space, blow them up. And what you would be able to see as a result are the array of asteroids that are there. Now, there's something that immediately people say, well, what about the radiation? What about the pollution? It's well, it's space. Or what people call space. I mean, that's another question itself. But my point is, that is the kind of thing that you probably would find it very hard to convince the majority of the American population today might be an appropriate way for us to actually figure out how to survive, not just for ourselves, but for all life on the planet. We don't know whether or not the prejudices, in other words, against scientific and technological progress that have already become almost second nature in the American population have already condemned all life on the planet to death. Nor can we worry about that. We, we, we don't have time to worry about that. We can do things now, and we can formulate a set of policies now that can change that circumstance, but there's a problem. Long time ago, Lyndon LaRouche wrote a document called The Content of Policy is the Method by Which It is Made. The Content of Policy is the Method by Which It is Made. And to that in, in, in that vein, what we're going to do today is we're going to take the basement presentation that was made on Wednesday. Uh, there were two presentations. One was made by Megan Beach, the other was made by Ben Denniston. And what we're going to do is we are going to, uh, uh, in showing these, try to again approach this question of hereditary error. Now to start us off as to what our, the issue is, of hereditary error. We're going to play a, a short clip from the American historian Eric Foner. Eric Foner is a teacher at Columbia University, and he's teaching a class on the Civil War. And we're just going to play 
uh, two minutes, literally two minutes, of his opening introduction for his course three. So if we can do that, our talking about the origins, the immediate origins, of the American Civil War. I mean, you can start in the first days of colonial settlement, if you want, to find origins of the Civil War, but we're not going to do that. We're going to start around 1850, the middle of the 19th century, but the first week we'll be looking back a little before that. We will look at the Civil War as a critical turning point in American history. Um, its conduct as a war, its impact on American life, particularly emphasizing the end of slavery, the emancipation of the four million slaves, and the consequences of that for North and South and the future of the United States. We will then look at Reconstruction, the period after the Civil War, um, as a struggle over the nature of the reunited nation and the legacy of slavery and its abolition. Now, as some of you know, this is a time period that I have devoted most of my career as a professional historian to. Um, the first history course I ever took at Columbia, long, long ago, I was an undergraduate, was a year-long seminar with a great teacher, none of you know who he was, but he was a wonderful teacher back then, James P. Shenton, on the, the coming of the Civil War, Civil War Reconstruction. So it shows you what an inspiring teacher can do to kind of lock your interest into something which is still there 50 years later. My first That's book, it. Free Soil, Free Labor. That's all the way. Okay, now, let's take what we just saw. The very first statement is, I mean, you can look at the origins of colonialism to find the origins of the Civil War. Actually, that would be a very bad idea. It's the very first thing he said to the students. That would be a very bad idea because the origins of the Civil War have to be located in the rejection of Alexander Hamilton's Federal Republic. You might more accurately, or you, excuse me, you might accurately state, perhaps, that the origins of the Civil War could be seen in the assassination of Alexander Hamilton in 1804. But I think even there, the point I want to make is he unintentionally, well, excuse me, he makes a statement, very first statement, which is not true. Because the establishment of the American Republic, which is the primary um, change in human history that had happened from the time of the Italian Renaissance until then, and until now, is not able to be uh, understood as commensurate with or equal to the colonial period of 1619, for example, when slavery was ostensibly introduced into uh, America, or something like that. The Federal Republic, the United States, is a completely different entity. It is a different species of existence. You cannot talk about American slavery, even, let alone the Civil War. But you can't even talk about American slavery as being the same after the establishment of the American Republic and before the establishment of the American Republic. Statements like this are made, and sometimes the people that make them are good historians. Eric Foner is not a bad historian at all. If you read his books on Reconstruction, there's a lot you can get out of them. But there's something he also then said. He said uh, he was caused to have this interest and to spend his entire life in this field because of a teacher he met who inspired him and as he said he can lock in, a great teacher can lock in your interest and it may be as great 50 years later. This is true and this is the issue of hereditary error. This is why last week what we did was that we changed direction within two hours on what we were originally going to present to our working group in New York. Now, why is this? We no longer have a New York-based organization, so, so to speak. There's no New York regional organization here. 
We abolished our regional organizations a few weeks ago in specific, with LaRouche asserting the existence of something he called the Manhattan Project. Now, the Manhattan Project is carried out by people that happen to be in New York and New Jersey, but it has very little to do with them as such. What it is is that it's a national project by Americans to cause the Federal Republic of Alexander Hamilton and the physical economy thereunto attached to be established again in the United States. That is what we are doing. Now, the physical economy of Hamilton is completely unlike the physical economy of Adam Smith or Karl Marx or anything that has existed in the, in the United States, particularly since the assassination of JFK. Yes, Ronald Reagan echoed an element of this policy in his Star Wars so-called, that is, Strategic Defense Initiative policy. And I just want to allude to the fact that the conference that we're intervening in right now in New York, in another location, where people seem to be talking about the great danger of nuclear war, most of the people in that conference were our bitter enemies at that time, and frankly would be our bitter enemies now if they actually had a theoretical understanding of what we're actually proposing. We're at a conference and we're intervening and we're trying to warn people that a certain evaluation that LaRouche has made, which is not commensurate with theirs, cannot be compared. It is a different species. Is the only evaluation that will actually work or should be thought through in terms of the present actual strategic danger. Okay, so what we're going to now do is this. We're going to turn to the webcast, and to do that, I want to introduce a few sentences from something by Wilhelm von Humboldt. Uh, Humboldt was one of the collaborators of Friedrich Schiller. You know, this essay was written in 1821. It's called On the Historian's Task. And I'm not going to read it exactly paragraph, sentence by sentence. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try to make a point from this document. He says, the historian's task is to present what actually happened. The more purely and completely he achieves this, the more perfectly has he solved his problem. An event, however, is only partially visible in the world of the senses. The manifestations of an event are scattered, disjointed, isolated. What it is that gives unity to this patchwork uh, plus the isolated fragments, puts the isolated fragments into proper perspective and gives shape to the whole, remains removed from direct observation. Remains removed from direct observation. For observation can perceive circumstances which either accompany or follow one another, but not their inner causal nexus, on which, after all, their inner truth is solely dependent. If one is trying to, uh, try, trying to talk about the most significant fact, but at the same time attempting strictly to tell only what actually happened, one soon notices how, unless the greatest care is employed in the choice and evaluation of expression, minute detriments, determinants rather, will creep in beyond the actual happening and will give rise to falsehood and uncertainty. Language itself contributes to the state of affairs since it frequently lacks expressions which are free from all connotations. Nothing is rarer, therefore, than a narrative which is literally true. Nothing, therefore, is rarer than a narr narrative which is literally true. So how do you know what happened? And how do you present what actually happened? He says many things, but I'm not going to go through all of it now. I can't. But I'll just say the following. The truth of any event is predicated on the addition of that invisible part of every fact. And it is this part which the historian has to add. Regarded in this way, he becomes active and even creative, not by bringing forth what does not have existence, but in giving shape by his own powers to that which by mere intuition he could not have perceived as it really was. Differently from the poet, but in a way similar to him, 
he must work the collected fragments into a whole. Now, so we have an historian in an academic setting at Columbia. But we have something else, which is making history. Is an historian someone who recounts history, or is an historian someone who makes history and therefore knows history? Now, Friedrich Schiller was an historian, and he had an idea about history. And the people that we're going to talk, to talk about, that <coughs> Megan and Ben Dennison are going to talk about, Kepler uh, and Nicholas Acuza, had the same idea. In other words, history is a creative active process, not of quote, making up facts, but of determining how real processes are actually discovered in the real physical universe. We do not merely recount, quote unquote, what happened by making a list of facts. Matter of fact, you can't know what happened by making a list of facts. And of course, without trying to, you know, take this down to many levels, you know, that, that's why people can't figure out yet what happened on 9-11, or what happened with the Kennedy assassination, or what happened with this, or what happened with that. You'll never figure it out that way. You can only actually know what goes on in the real physical universe by means of the use of hypothesis, a scientific hypothesis that discovers the real processes of the mind and therefore discovers the real processes of the physical universe because they are one. The real processes of the mind and the real processes of the physical universe are one. And no one has ever had an idea of the physical universe which was not born inside of the mind itself as the mind reflects that physical universe. There is no such thing as a division between the true ideas of the mind and the true ideas of nature, and there never could be. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what uh, uh, Megan Beats uh, begins with. I, maybe you're starting at the very beginning, or is it? Where do we want to do? If you can start right Hello, there. today is February 20th. Yeah. If you can go just, uh, he's not very long, but you should probably, if you can get to her directly. Um, <laughs> yeah, just run a little down a little bit. Hello, today is February 25th, 2015, and you're joining us for our weekly basement report. My name is Jason Ross, and I'll be hosting today. I'm joined in the studio by Ben Denniston and Megan Beats of our science research team. And I want to give a bit of an overview before we jump into the meat of the matter today. As in last week, the two most important crises that are threatening the world at the present, the most uh, explosive one in last night, was that this shows that the United Kingdom is pulling out the stops, any opposition to have nothing barring a full-on move more directly against the eye. Spain has introduced a motion to change the UN Charter, preventing the use of Britain and the direction that we ought to go. The last person who really defined that for mankind, which was Johannes Kepler. And it's going to be nothing short of that which will ensure the success of man's continued existence on and off of this planet. So what Kepler did, and I'm going to let Ben get into that in a little bit more detail than I will, but. Kepler defined the solar system, and uh, by that I don't mean he defined the objects in the solar system. He defined the process of the solar system, which subsumes the Earth that we're all sitting on, as a human principle. Mm -hmm. And if Kepler located the cause of the solar system, the unity of the multitude or the multiplicity of the solar system, in a concept which was absolutely beyond mathematics and beyond calculation and all logical use of number, logical use of the extrapolation of language and number to come to some understanding of the solar system. And what he demonstrated is that the concept governing the solar system could only be understood by the human mind in the same way that a group of human musicians are able to tune their various notes and their various 
lines to perform and unfold a beautiful piece of music as a musical composition. Now this proof that man's mind can know beyond number and beyond math, beyond and above mathematics, that there is some experience, there's mental life, which can uh, detect and discover truth in the universe, which is beyond the use of number per se, this set off a complete revolution in mankind, which we're still fighting to f fulfill mm -hmm. today in actually moving out into that solar system and beginning to govern and organize and, and have more and more influence over the activity of that solar system today, as we see in the space program of China. Now, this distinction between the lower uh, species of mathematics and the higher species of human discovery and human mental activity, this is rooted in uh, somebody who lived a couple of hundred years before Kepler, which was the great Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa, who sparked the Italian Renaissance. And Kepler actually declared himself explicitly a follower of Cusa in his first work, the Mysterium Cosmographicum, which he published when he was, I think, in his early 20s where he notes early on in the work, it's probably going to be a terrible paraphrase, but something to the effect of um, Nicholas of Cusa seems to me divine mm -hmm. in that he locates the absolute distinction between the polygon and the circle and compares the polygon to the mind of man and the circle to the mind of God. And I'll, I'll come back to that example in a few minutes here, but that's exactly what Cusa did. Cusa established a new doctrine of the mind of man. Now, when he was born, Kuz was born in 1401 in Germany. He becomes, as I said, um, a cardinal in the Catholic Church. The time that he's born into is completely dominated in science, in social doctrine, in government, by the doctrine of Aristotle, by the idea that man is nothing but an intelligent beast and that man, man's superior, Jason, you brought this up a few months ago on the show here, that man, in, in Aristotle's work, De Anima, on the soul, Aristotle says, man is nothing but a beast, and the way in which he is superior to all other beasts is in his superior sense of touch, which is the only mode of direct perception. <laughs> um, but this is, this is the idea. Aristotle said that it is the natural order not to be violated, that some are born to rule and others are born to be slaves. He said that man's mind is, and soul are nothing but uh, as a blank tablet, as a blank slate, upon which nothing is written. And over the course of the experience of life, sense impressions write and, and create form objects in the mind of man. Mm -hmm. So man's mind is born empty and throughout the course of his existence his blank slate is written upon by objects of sense perception. And it's in being able to organize and um, make draw conclusions about these facts of sense perception that man comes to know. Mm -hmm. So out of this the idea that it's but a logical arrangement of essentially sense things derived of sense perception that all knowledge is derived comes the um, really crippling lie which held back science, held back the progress of society for centuries that uh, of the impossibility of contradictories. So in other words, a thing cannot be both A and not A at the same time, right? Something cannot be both very hot and very cold at the same time. A man can't be very tall and very short at the same time, right? Um, so it it was against, and, and actually it thinkers before Kuza had declared Aristotle's doctrine to be against the Christian religion, which is something that Kepler himself notes in his Harmony of the World. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's against exactly this that Nicholas of Kuza intervenes. And in 1437, when he is, uh, he's been sent to Constantinople as a diplomat, on a diplomatic mission from the Vatican in the attempts to reunite the Western and the Eastern churches. So Cusa is sent to Byzantium to bring back representatives of the Eastern Orthodox Church to the council in the West. 
as an attempt to reunite. And um, his mission is incredibly successful. He actually ends up bringing back 700 representatives of Byzantium, including the patriarch of the Orthodox Church, mm. the emperor of Byzantium, and a great advisor to the emperor of Byzantium, Plethon, who is the greatest scholar of Plato in existence on the planet. Mm. Um, so it, it, it's on the boat returning from Constantinople that, as Cusa relates, he had his great discovery mm -hmm. of a completely new method of thinking and a completely new method of or, or concept of mind which crushes and over, overturns the Aristotelian lie, which is, as opposed to Aristotle's impossibility of opposites or of contradictories, Cusa asserts the truth of the coincidence of opposites, that um, before you had contradictories, you had a, a principled unity in the mind of God, which can be understood in a certain way by the mind of man. So in other words, man is not limited to the contradictories of sense perception, but he can leap beyond them. Mm -hmm. So one example he gives to come back is the polygon and the circle. That if you have a circle and a polygon inscribed in the circle, well, they're different. So you can imagine a circle with a triangle inscribed in that circle. Now, if you keep doubling the number of sides, say from three to six sides, now to 12 sides, 24, and so on, that polygon inside the circle begins to approximate the circle, begins mm -hmm. to look very much like the circle. You get to the thousands of sides, you can't distinguish the polygon from the circle by looking at it. Right, it feels like a circle too. Yeah, right. Mm. But as Kuza points, so Kuza points out that though the polygon is, is more and more approximating and seeming to come into unity with the circle, there's a crucial irony, which is that as you add more sides and more angles to the polygon, you're actually getting farther and farther away from the quality of a circle, which is that it has no angles and no sides. And so as Kuza says, the only way to proceed and to resolve this is that there's no way to proceed from the polygon to the circle. They're two completely different species, but that you have to almost as a leap think on the higher level. That once you understand that these are two different species, man's mind can begin to think in the high, as the higher species on the higher level. Mm -hmm. Now he, he um, uses a different image to attempt to illustrate his meaning in a work called On the Vision of God, where he compares God, which is at, who is absolute infinity, absolute truth, to uh, he says that God dwells as if within the garden of paradise, which is guarded by the wall of contradictories. And that it's only if man can vanquish the guard to the gateway into paradise, which is uh, his reasoning. Right, so, so vanquish the reasoning, the back and forth reasoning, it's, you know, as, as in Aristotle's impossibility of contradictories. It's only if you can banish the kind of logical use of mind that comes with objects of sense perception and take almost a leap of faith over this wall of contradictories can you begin to conceive of the infinite. So then one example of the infinite he gives is that the, God's light is infinite light beyond all perceptible light and is therefore absolute darkness. Hmm. And so can the mind come to conceptualize a quality of light which is so infinitely light that it's absolute darkness? Mm -hmm. And um, and I know these are quick examples, and Kuza is, is almost, um, he's relentless in that he never lets you sit with one particular image. He keeps driving these images mm -hmm. forward. Um, but it, it is this elimination of the Aristotelian tyranny of man's mind as a derivative of the body, mm -hmm. you know, the body up. Mm -hmm. And Kuza reasserts the, uh, the mind of man as an image of the creator's mind which is, um, which, you know, bears the light of, the light of truth. And he lays this out really brilliantly in a work called, um, in English called The Layman on Mind, which is a wonderful dialogue between a very learned philosopher and a layman, a craft, simple craftsman, 
or the philosopher is constantly being educated by this simple layman mm. on as to matters of great import. So at a certain point in the dialogue, the philosopher asks the layman, from where does mind have this power of judgment in as much as mind seems to make judgments regarding all things. Now the layman responds, the mind has this power of judgment by virtue of the fact that it is the image of the exemplar of all things, for God is the exemplar of all things. Hence, since the exemplar of all things shines forth in the mind as a true object shines forth in its image, mind has within itself that unto which it looks. So I'll just read that again. Since the exemplar of all things shines forth in the mind as a true object shines forth in its image, mind has within itself that unto which it looks and in accordance with which it judges about external objects. It is as if a written code of law were alive. Because, yeah, because it was alive, it could read within itself the judgments that were to be dispensed. Hence, the mind is a living description of eternal, infinite wisdom. But in our minds, at the beginning, that life resembles someone asleep until it is aroused to activity by wonder, which arises from the influence of perceptible objects, which is completely different than Aristotle's idea of the relationship of perceptual objects to man. He says, thereupon, by the operation of its intelligent life, mind finds described within itself that which it is seeking. The situation is as if an indivisible and most simple pointed tip of an angle of a very highly polished diamond were alive, and as if in this pointed tip were reflected the forms of all things. By looking at itself, the living tip would find the likenesses of all things, and by means of the likenesses, it could make concepts of all things. Mm. So, um, okay. Now, we're going to just want to take this up. Let's remember now who Nicholas Cusa was and what happened. Why do you want to remember that? Because that's what we better do right now. That is to say, he unified East and West. You're in a situation in which what the proposal actually before us involves is that some form of you could call it diplomacy, but really some form of grand strategy has got to be caused to prevail in the earth today that will have the effect of reconciling Russia, China, India, and the United States, independent of the British Empire, for the purpose of a set of what appear to be economic and physical economic projects, but actually is for the purpose of creating a new uh, platform for human progress on and off the planet. In specific, the most important element of the collaboration must be the strategic defense of the Earth, which may already be too late, but must be pursued as rapidly as it can be. And of course, time can be changed based on discoveries and inventions that occur as a result of that collaboration, both in the areas of physics as such but also in the areas of, of human thought as a whole. I mean, that's what has to happen. Now, uh, the person most qualified presently on the planet to deal with that is Lyndon LaRouche because he's also trusted by Russians. I mean, that's basically the real reason. He's trusted by the Russians because he already did this with the Russians between 1981 and 1983, 84. And he successfully negotiated a policy that he caused the United States to adopt despite the fact that the United States ostensibly, factions in the United States at least, were preventing that from happening. Matter of fact, he was told in the negotiations that he was doing with the then Soviet Union at the time that their people in the United States, and those people that they had who they trusted because of their expert advice and their knowledge, expert knowledge of American affairs, 
absolutely assured them there was no possibility that LaRouche could ever get his policy through. And therefore, they cut off the negotiations with LaRouche, and two months after they cut off the negotiations, Reagan announced the policy. Thus demonstrating that their experts, as well as the people in the, American, the uh, Reagan administration, such as James Baker, Casper Weinberger, and several others, who had no idea that Ronald Reagan was about to announce that policy, despite the fact that they were his cabinet, that a policy could be made to prevail by means of a method that actually basically superseded and transcended all policy channels that seemed to exist. In other words, what had happened was that an invisible policy channel had been walked right into the White House, right past everybody, right past the Russians, right past British intelligence, right past the so-called CIA, right past the, well, not past the NSC, because the NSC was working with the policy at the time, but it walked past everybody because they chose to be blind to the species of idea that was being proposed, which only required the President of the United States to adopt it. That's what happened. That actually happened. That's real history. Now that real history and the relationship to that real history is how Vladimir Putin and people in the Russian high command, including the military command, see Lyndon LaRouche. Here in America, well, there's no, I mean, there are a few people who know this, but there are very few people, of course, at least willing to state that they have that relationship or could have that relationship to policy. But now, the reason I bring that up is because we well, just heard something here about Nicholas Acuza, that all the things you've just heard that were said about the mind of God and the relationship of the mind of man to the mind of God were all being formulated or most of it was being formulated methodologically on a ship coming back from a diplomatic mission in which he's got 700 plus people coming from a, 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 a schismed church. In other words, the Catholic Church, and particularly even from the time of the Council of Basel about 15 years before this, uh, was in horrible shape. And what was happening was that there was an attempt to create this mission to reunify, not merely the church, but to create a situation where progress, human progress, could somehow be put on another level, another footing. And Kuza has to struggle with this because he knows that when it comes to matters of doctrine, you're going to have to somehow transcend the differences. And a new method of thinking is needed. So she's gone through and she's outlined a few things, but I want to just reference one uh, in particular uh, thing that, she, that, that, uh, that Megan said at the end there. This idea that the mind has within itself that unto which it looks, and in, in accordance with which it judges about external objects. It is as if a written code of law were alive. Because if it, if it were alive, it could read within itself <coughs> the judgments that were to be dispensed. Now that is the only efficient conception of self-governance or self-government. Hmm? The mind has within itself that unto which it looks and in accordance with which it judges about external objects. It is as if a written code of law were alive. Because if it were alive, it could read within itself the judgments that were to be dispensed. And that is the preamble of the Constitution of the United States, as opposed to the particular articles of the Constitution of the United States. We've often emphasized this, and it's often caused people confusion. So I want to say something about this. We've emphasized that there are two elements to the, to the actual governing of the United States, the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution not the body of the Constitution, although that's not, un, that's not unimportant. But the body of the Constitution is a spelling out of certain things that are implicit within the action of the preamble. Many people make a big deal about the Bill of Rights and all this. Truthfully, the Bill of Rights is not necessary. It's today necessary because you have a largely illiterate America, American population. But it's not actually necessary to the document. Because the actual preamble to the Constitution outlines 
the intent of the Constitution, by the way, it was written by a man by the name of Gouverneur Mar Morris. Gouverneur Morris was a very close friend of Alexander Hamilton, gave the eulogy at his funeral, uh, was very active here in New York, he was a state legislator and one of the major people in, involved in the, uh, of course, Constitutional Convention, and he wrote the preamble. So it's Hamilton and Hamilton's faction that defined this idea of America, and it was Cusa who wrote in what he called the Concordantia Catholica. He created the basic theory which became what we state later in the Declaration of Independence. We've emphasized this before as well. So I wanted to first just, uh, just say that at this stage about what you've seen. Now there's another element here, and I, don't, and I want to uh, not try to, uh, we don't want to filibuster here about, because there should be questions about this. Because what's being outlined here about this issue of the polygon and the circle and the relationship between that, the mind of man and the mind of God, let me just give an illustration. Uh, Megan talked about a triangle inscribed within a circle, where you can consider that as though a, a circle, here's your pyramid shape in solid form, three sides, four sides, the square or cube, five sides with the dodecahedron. Hmm? And, and also here, another, another way of looking at it, five sides here as well with the icosahedron, 20 sides as actually, but you see also a projection. These things are in an in, inversion of each other. They're duels, it's called. So our point is that these can begin to look more circular, but the very fact that you add angles and sides means that you're going farther away from the nature of a circle. That was already said, I'm just repeating it. But I want to be very clear about that, because a circle has either no sides, one side, or an infinite number of sides. You can put it either, any of those ways, but you cannot talk about it as having multiples of sides. Polygon, that means many gone, ma ma many sided figure. So any figure that has many sides can never become a circle. Would just never happen, no matter how long you do that, because they are of two different species. And the issue in terms of what we're talking about and what's being posed is that the mind of God does not work the way that the mind of man works. Although, wait a minute, that must in some fashion not be true because how would the mind of man even conceive of God unless the mind of man in some fashion worked the way that the mind of God works? How could you even make the statement that God's mind is completely different unless you had a concept of the difference of the two minds? And therefore, some, as they call it, exemplar, some idea of that perfect mind. So this idea that was said here, I just want to repeat this. Uh, mind has within itself that unto which it looks and in accordance with which it judges about external objects. Mind has within itself that unto which it looks. Now that, in Catholic doctrine, is sometimes referred to as the filioque. That the reason that the Catholic Church would have said that Aristotle was anti-Christian, that in the Catholic Church there's this notion that there's a divinity within man. And that this divinity within man is what is affirmed by Christ and his crucifixion important because if you read Cusa and you read things like Learned Ignorance, you will see this is a theological work. It, it is a scientific treatise, yes, but it, it comes from the standpoint of theology. What we're going to do now is we're going to listen to how Ben then picks this up, and he's going to take us into Kepler. We're not going to go all the way through what he does because he begins discussing various things about musical intervals, and it became clear to me as I heard it that it would be better uh, at the point that that's discussed, to have an actual either keyboard or way to show the intervals uh, so, that, so that this uh, is not left to just his having to describe what thirds are and seconds and this kind of thing. So we're going to play that section so you can see why there is a coherence or congruence between the two figures, Kuza and Kepler. So let's just pick it up there. Time is it? Time is it? I think it's right in there. She finishes and then he just picks right up. So I think if you just play right from there, you're good. It's about 20, it was about 25 minutes in if you already moved it. Absolutely. 
absolutely identical created things. So from this, he says, hence, if the Earth volume. cannot be positive. So the Earth's not the center. The Earth must move. And there's the, the Earth cannot be a perfect sphere, spherical body with an absolutely perfect um, shape. Mm -hmm. It demonstrated and valid which then allowed him to make the breakthroughs that other people couldn't make, didn't you go make. Back a little bit. And really, you know, in a certain sense, we'll approach and looking at Kepler. Gave man a completely new concept of the solar system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this, you know, <clears throat> it's just coming off of, uh, you know, Mr. LaRouche has emphasized that this is, this continuity is critical, understanding both Cousa and Kepler's uh, having this direct connection, their methodological approach, and then looking at Kepler's work, all of Kepler's discoveries, his revolution from this standpoint. This is what he was rooted in. This is how he thought. This was the unique quality of thought, of method he brought to the investigation, which then allowed him to make the breakthroughs that other people couldn't make, didn't make. And really, you know, in a certain sense, really demonstrated and validated Kuz's philosophical as his thought. His, his conception of how the universe is organized and how right. mankind relates to it. And, um, you know, coming off of that, I wanted to go through kind of some developing hypotheses in how to now today look back at Kepler's work on the organization of the solar system, but really honing in on this, this central thesis that you just put out, that um, it's not this blank slate conception it's not numbers, it's not mathematics, but uh, science and our understanding of the universe is premised upon our understanding of the human mind as a, you know, as Kuza put, a microcosm of the macrocosm of God, the creator. That there's a certain unique potential that the human mind has that we can't just define, we can't define by other metrics, we can't define it by sense perception, we can't define it by chemistry or biology or anything else. We have to study it itself and study what is it that the human mind is, um, how can, how does human society function? And that then tells us more about mankind's relationship to the universe and really the universe as a whole than anything just based on sense perception could. And I think there's some interesting stuff that we'll get into that really potentially uh, takes that conception even further in a very exciting way. Um, but to set that up, you know, as you said, Kepler looked at how is this whole solar system organized. Um, and people are probably familiar with doing a lot with the screen here, going through a number of things. Um, so this is from this earlier work that you cited, his Mysterium Cosmographicum. He asked the question, why are the planets distanced from each other at the distances that they are, right? Why is, we have six planets, five distances between those six planets, and then why are those distances the particular values they are? And just to reference back to um, this being not a mathematical or numerical approach, he, he plays with that at the beginning, he says, could we just have a ratio of numbers? Like, could it just be a simple proportion? One planet is to the next planet, is that planet is to the next planet? And he shows that that doesn't work. Um, which is interesting because that later came up with this tidious bode relation to try and explain it that way. But he already early on shows that, you know, just working with the ratios of numbers doesn't work and he's forced to go to this idea of the, these solids, these regular shapes in three-dimensional visual space as defining the distancing between the planets. That's what he plays with in that, in his uh, first major work, this Mysterium Cosmographicum. And then as he makes his revolution with the um, new astronomy and really gets into the, the causes of the motions of the individual planets. Um, he defines this idea that the planets are eccentric. They don't move on uh, circles. They have a constantly changing distance from the sun. So now you don't just have one distance from the sun. Like if you have, um, I mean, he recognized it back here too, but he was able to further explore it upon going through the work of the harmonies of the world, that you have not just one distance from the sun for each planet, but you have two distances. You have a range of distances. You have an extreme 
far distance and a close distance, an apohelial distance farthest from the sun, a perihelial distance closest to the sun for each planet. So you can kind of see it represented the top orbit is Saturn's orbit. You have three circles, each representing different distances from the sun that Saturn reaches. The farthest distance, the closest distance, and the middle distance. So then Kepler, you know, towards the end of his life, takes up this, retakes up this question of, well, why are these distances what they are? These, these differing distances in any one planet's orbit are attributed to the eccentricity, how eccentric its orbit is. So he takes up the question, why do the planets have these particular eccentricities? Why do they have the distances they do, and why do they have the particular eccentricities they do? Um, and he comes to this conception that we have to look at, uh, we have to take this from the standpoint of a musical approach. We have to look at the uh, intervals created by the extreme motions of the planets. Uh, one planet to itself, and then planets to other planets. And so you have here, for example, two two planets, an inner planet and an outer planet. You can see that um, if they were circular orbits, they'd look, they look it uh, correspond to the blue dotted dot, but they're elliptical and they have a certain amount of eccentricity, so you can see they vary in their distance from the sun. So any planet, again, has a farthest distance and a closest distance. And what Kepler looks at is what are the um, relationships between the, uh, what would be the perceived motion of these planets at their extremes? So for example, the inner planet, the red one is pretty close to what would be its farthest motion from the sun, at which point it'd be going its slowest. The outer planet, the green one, is just about at its closest distance from the sun, where it'd be going its fastest. And Kepler says, well, what if we looked at the ratio of uh, how they would appear to move from the sun at those extreme positions and see if those create um, the type of harmonic intervals you get in music? I'm giving a very quick overview of a you know, 500 plus page work that um, 600 page plus in that range that you know should obviously be worked through in detail. but. Uh, to set up, um, looking at some more recent discoveries from this standpoint, I'm just going to give him a quick overview. But see, he's he's got this idea that you have to look at the apparent perceived motions at these extremes and look for the harmonic organization, look for characteristics that we associate with harmonies in music and in sound. And he says, for any two, for any one orbit, you have you could comp you want to compare the extreme motions, what's its fastest motion and what's its slowest motion. That defines a certain interval, and he investigates that from looking for the harmonic intervals defined there. You can look at neighboring planets, the outer planet and the inner planet, and in that case you have four relationships that are kind of the bounding conditions. You have um, each planet has a fastest and a slowest, so you could do fastest to fastest, slowest to slowest, fastest to slowest, slowest to fastest. So you have four he calls them the converging motions when their speeds get the closest to one another, the diverging motions when you have the biggest difference between the speeds, and then the apohelial when they're both at their respective farthest distances, and the perihelial when they're both at their respective closest distances. So he has this, so again, he's saying, why, why is the system organized the way it is? We have some conception with the, the solids defining the distancing of the planets. But we know that the planets have these particular eccentricities. Why are those eccentricities what they are? And he develops a whole system examining the relation between the extreme motions and defines an entire harmonic organization to the system. That the, con the conception of musical harmonies and a musical harmonic system um, is necessary to then understand why the eccentricities are what they are and then allows him then to go back from having defined the entire solar system from these harmonic ratios which are uh, 
exhibited here, he's able to then go back and recalculate, re-derive the distances and the eccentricities from the harmonics. So you start with, by the end, he starts with what he defines as the required necessary harmonic intervals for any individual planets and certain pairs of planets. He says why those are what they are. And then from there is able to derive and define the solar system as a product of this required harmonic organization. Yeah, and just to, by required, I mean, I was thinking it's similar to what Kuza does and what I read from the doctor. Kuza did, wasn't basing his thoughts off of any data or any observations. He was just thinking about what ought to be based mm -hmm. on first principles. And Kepler did that too. Informed by the data and informed by his knowledge of the motions, he then puts the motions aside and thinks from the standpoint of first causes, what ought the motions to, what ought the motions be in order to have the most harmonic tuned system possible? Right. And then from there, he derives what the distances would have to be to make those motions. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's a, the one example that sticks out in my mind that's fun is this examination of um, the motions of the Earth and Venus. Because he says the, the system should express the distinction between um, major and minor, or hard and soft, as he says it. Like that's something that is part of music. It's part of a musical system, so therefore it should be expressed somewhere in the system. Um, you know, from first causes, as you're saying, you're, you're saying that the system has to be reflected. Okay, let's take this point and what Megan's interruption was because of what it did and where you are. Now, here's the situation. There is an end of a system which was not really a, it was a system, it's been generally invisible to people. It has occurred. The Wall Street system is over. There's nothing that's going to be done to save it. There's no way to reconnect it. There's no way to reform it. But all of that is exactly the zone in which all thinking among all nation states, with the exception of those associated with the BRICS process, that's the zone of everybody's thinking. And anything that you try to think within that domain is actually incommensurable with what is true. Incommensurable just means you can't measure the truth by any of that. Now, a set of negotiations and policies and discussions and TV programs and, and protests and you name it go on every day, every day around this. And you know, basically what LaRouche has said continually to us, which is tended to make a lot of people kind of angry is he really can't allow his associates to define themselves in the way that old political activists used to. That is, you're trying to fight against, you're fighting the power, you're uh, rage against the machine, uh, Occupy Wall Street, any of this stuff. It, it, this has nothing to do with anything that we are about. We are not, in that regard, a political movement. Not, not that way. But there is something, hmm? for example, the, the idea of the republic, race public, of public things. Yes, that we are doing. But now look at how we just defined the idea of necessity. What, what happened and what Megan did, and, and, and of course Ben had gone through and given you the conception of how Kepler was deploying the concept of harmonies. For those who are uh, mystified by the concept of harmonies, the best way to demystify yourself is go to the chorus. The best way to demystify yourself on the concept of harmonies and tuning is to join the chorus. Uh, and that is no joke, that is essential. And matter, matter of fact, it becomes essential to your political work because you're going to have to master uh, this material. Not I mean not just what you're hearing here. We'll have to figure it out, and it may not be simple, but in some fashion, you're going to have to work your way through the harmonies. This idea the har of, of Kepler's harmonies of the world. We'll figure out how that has to be done. We, there may be various things we have to allow for, but unless you understand it, then you can't come by a clear idea of physical economy. Why? Well, because what Kepler did in discovering the solar system is he figured out the physical cause for the way in which things were ordered. It was a physical cause. It wasn't, in other words, merely a theory. You know, Plato had had a theory. It's in a work called the Timaeus. 
It's very good. It is scientific. It is a scientific conception, but yet it wasn't something that was precisely or empirically grounded. Yes, he did use the famous Platonic solids, as they were called. Hmm? It comes from Egypt, actually, but called Platonic solids for our purposes. Uh, and, he, and he did formulate an hypothesis based on a, a, a notion of physical geometry, but this is different. What's happened here, what's being described here, we're not then haven't gotten to the principle of gravitation and so forth here, but that's what is underlying universal gravitation ideas, underlying what you're hearing. The point is that what we're doing is we're defining, and Kepler defined the actual beginning of what's called physical economy. The LaRouche organization, under the guidance of Lyndon LaRouche, is not discussing political economy. Political economy is what Karl Marx discussed. Political economy is what Adam Smith represented, or you know, other people, uh, Kinney and you know, uh, many others that we don't have to go through, the physiocrats. And a lot of people were, phys were political economists. Mm -hmm. Malthus was, had, was, had the first chair of political economy, or political science, political economy, at uh, Haleyburg University, I think it was. Uh, that's not what we're doing. We're doing something different. Uh, ben Franklin referred to this as natural philosophy. But what's, what we're after and what's going on here, what the conception is, what's being offered is that there's a notion of necessity that is not there because of its so, the physical objects. There was no solar system until Kepler invented it. That's not bridging with me or something. I mean, LaRouche has been asserting this. Let me just repeat this. There was no solar system until Kepler invented it. Now, the idea is, well, does that mean there was no order in the universe? Yes, but the universe did not know it as order. The universe came to know it as order through the invention of the notion of the solar system by Kepler. Now, you may want to think about that, go home and think about that, but that's what actually happened. There's a, there's a, a, a quote from a poem by Shelley called Mont Blanc. It uh, starts, it says, the everlasting universe of things flows through the mind. It goes on from there, but that idea, the everlasting universe of things flows through the mind. So there is a, there is a unity between what we call, or have been caused to call, erroneously, the subjective and the objective. Mm -hmm. And it's these idea of first principles we're talking about is a way of establishing, if you will, a set of spiritual exercises of discovery and invention. Now, this is a field that Kepler was an expert in. This is also the field of J.S. Bach, uh, the composer. But what's going on here, what's being presented, and what the discussion is, is uh, intended to allow our people, which is why we do this each week, uh, or in the basement does it, I mean, and we present it each week, to actually get a grasp of how to think about what the science of physical economy is, is, is intended to mean. Um, so we're going to play a little bit more of this, and then we'll conclude. Uh, we'll take any questions, and uh, I would just recommend that what everybody do between now and next week is look at this. Go on and get the whole thing. Look at it through. Uh, through. Write down questions that you have about it, uh, and when we, when we meet next week, uh, we'll take this up uh, uh, further. So we're going to just play a little bit more of this now so that we don't have to let that point hang. Of, of our conception of musical harmony. So therefore, that has to be expressed somewhere. I always see it in the Mars-Earth, or the Venus-Earth relationship. So yeah, so he's going back from, um, not just going from the data, but going from what should be required if the universe is organized by this harmonic conception, which mankind uniquely can define and understand. So, and I think his introduction to this table is fun. I, again, I'm also, right? butchering a quote by paraphrasing but he says something to the effect of and now we're going to try a calculation which has never before been attempted or tried in human history which is 
starting from the harmonies and deriving the distances and the eccentricities from from the harmonic organization of the solar system. So it's you know, a lot could be said about that work. It's a revolutionary work. His whole life is a revolutionary work. Demonstrating Kuz's conception to be valid, that we have to start from an understanding of the human mind as an expression of the organization of the universe in its most fundamental sense. And that's the basis for science. Now, in okay, looking into this, okay, one thing that I've been kind of provoked by after like five, a few years five. is, you know, following Kepler's revolution, um, and his. I hate to do it, but we're we're 5:25, so it'd be out of 5:30, right? I think that's right. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, if there's any questions at all, let's do that quick. The real question. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So, what well, um actually has something to do with the harmony of the universe? Is there a piece in specific that would? Connect the, the harmony of the universe as Kepler would describe it. No, what there isn't, there isn't that. What the, here's what there is. There's a, is there's a there's an experiment called the Manhattan Project. And here's what it is. I've said this before. You know, the original Manhattan Project was about a nuclear, uh, you, somehow being able to harness nuclear reactions, right, for human use. That's what it was, right? Okay. What our project is, is creating the equivalent of an intellectual chain reaction. We are not trying to get to 28 pages, or get Glass-Steagall, or you know any of that. We're going to do those things. But what we are trying to do is we're trying to wake up the mind. The thing that was said again by Kuzer here, this, this is all within the mind of people, but it's as though it's, the mind is asleep. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to create the idea of living, a living set of laws, that exact idea that was stated. And that's the best way to say it, because that's really what the purpose is, and that's what we're doing. Uh, it is as if a written code of law were alive. Because if it were alive, it could read within itself the judgments that were to be dispensed. The, the, the old Nation of Islam people used to talk about black people as dead. They used to say Negro was really Necro, which it was not, but they used to have fun with this, right? Necro. So the idea was you were just the dead. And the issue was that you had to be become you had to be the lost foundation. It's the same idea that you have a, a American population which is dead. As dead. And what you're doing is you if, if life if, if 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 the laws were alive in the people they would read within themselves the authority to change them. So that's what the Manhattan Project is about. Just so that is, 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 is clear. Yes, go ahead. In other words, the true purpose of the Lurus Pact is to reprogram the American mind to, uh, instead of using imagination to escape reality, we use it to create reality. Well, no. No, the, pr the purpose is, is simple. The mind have, holds within it hmm, the entirety of the universe because it is an efficient microcosmic expression of the macrocosm. It's an efficient way, in a minimal way, of capturing everything that's in the universe. But then there's a law to that. In other words, you, 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 you can only do that a certain way. And, and you've got to do that by means of, of discovering how the human race actualizes the purpose of the universe. That's what science is about. They're, they're, I won't say more than that. I mean, that's what we are, and that's why we've said recently, and we and well, Lur, excuse me, Larouche has recently said. I didn't say Larouche recently said that this is a theological proposition that we're putting forward, and he doesn't mean by that a doctrinal Christian or Jewish or Muslim or something. That's not what he's referring to. It's referring to the idea that there is a creative force in the universe comprehensible to all that choose to, su to submit themselves to this idea of scientific inquiry, which is uniquely expressed in certain individuals and is being carried out and can be actualized in a political form. So 
It's very important to put it that way because none of our reprogramming or programming, it, it has very little to do with any of those things. And, and we have to be, I think, a little rigorous about that because there are people that do talk about that. That's not what we're doing, nor do we require to do it. You don't have to do that with people. People have within them the innate capability to know all that is required to be known. But, but politics is about unleashing that capability. And I'd just like to say one last thing about hereditary error. Mr. Foner had a teacher that inspired him. And I'm not going to blame his teacher for the error that Mr. Foner made. He also said, someone like that can lock you in. They can lock your interest in. And for a half a century, you may pursue that. This is the whole issue of what it is we wish to free the American people from. Hereditary error passed on unknowingly uh, because we choose to speak on too low a level to one another about what our minds can actually do and what they are required to do on behalf of humanity as a whole. And so physical economy for us is, is, a, is, a, is not a set of, of policies. It's a, 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 ma a means of thinking that, that renders people free from all of the uh, axioms that seem to surround and seem to define and seem to crush not only their own cre creativity, but, but, but their lives in every, in every way. So, so that's what we're trying to do. And um, the basement team is leading that because this is an area which is uncharted. Um, some of it is known, but most of what we're doing is not. Uh, and it's being discovered as we go. Uh, yeah, how is okay. it? I just, I've been very interested looking at the website, what LaRouche is saying about the Zeusian thing mm -hmm. and, the, and the nuclear war, and that some guys are very actively thinking about how they can win a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, I just see, you know, this, the contradiction, which on one hand, he's sort of saying against all this greeny, uh, unproved stuff that a nuclear war would just kill people with clouds or nuclear winter or all that crap. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, I also could see, you know, if you, if you destroy like 50,000 key square miles, you might disrupt civilization so much that people would just tend to die anyway, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But, I, you know, it's an interesting contradiction. You know? Yeah, but yeah, well, it's a good example of yeah. what Megan was talking about earlier yeah. on this idea of the wall of contradiction because yeah. the, the issue is Lin is being very clear. He, of course, is saying any conception of warfare at all is insane. But he also recognizes that there is a group of people who believe that it's possible to square the circle or to make a polygon like in unto a circle. So their intention is not to launch some global nuclear war where everybody gets blown up. That's not what they're doing. And he's concerned with us actually over the last 24 hours was that if we were going to go talk to people, such as, as happening at this particular conference that's going on today in New York, those people are, are inclined to get up and say, we're all going to die in a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. And his point was, look, if, you, if, if people do that, you could actually induce what you're talking about, mm -hmm. precisely because what you're doing is you're going to spread a panic mm -hmm. that that's the enemy, that that's the, the orientation, and it isn't. That's like, for example, the notion that, for example, since India and Pakistan both have nuclear weapons, yeah. if you can drive Pakistan crazy, which isn't that difficult to yeah. do at this point, right? You know, maybe they would use them. Well, they wouldn't be lobbing them to everybody in the in the world, right? They'd be lobbing them around India, yeah. the Indian subcontinent. Yeah. So, so there's ways in which, right? You can play games with this idea, yeah. and what Lynn is saying is that. The problem we have is that the experts are bad on this. They don't really get it. They don't really understand, the, because they don't understand the bankruptcy of Wall Street. That's why. They, 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 there are plenty of people who are experts on military affairs, but do they understand the context and the method by which that policy would actually be made? That, that's where the problem is. So that's, that's why, and there's more that can be said on the whole Zeusian thing, but I think that's important. In the back and then to you. Uh, I came to the conclusion yesterday that um, we, we no longer have a republic. We do have a democracy, and we have blind fascists. Do you have something? Uh, that is, you, you said there was no solar system until Kepler That's right. discovered it. That's what I said. But before then, 
why aren't the planets always there yeah. with their orbits and sure or, or, or maybe it was not called the system until Kepler named, named it as a system. But it's more than a name. That's the whole point. It's more than a name. The, the, I'll only say this much about it because I said that precisely to provoke that question. Yes, there is nature, for example, because in other words, this is a anti-Darwin, Darwinist view, right, of conception, as also any Aristotelian. It says that, kind, that, that creativity and, the, and a being of creativity precedes the so-called objective world. And that man's mind, ma that man's mind is of a nature that it can comprehend that or a apprehend that reality. Now, so I don't try to be fancy here. Let me be really as straight as I can be. What I believe, let me say it that way, so if I'm wrong, then Linda LaRouche or somebody can correct it and the tape goes out and doesn't get everybody screwed up, okay? What I believe that Lynn was saying when he said that is not different in my mind to what Kruse talks about by the following idea. He has an idea called actualized potential. What he's saying is, before anything exists, the potential for it to exist must be there. You can't have a baby born unless the potential for it to be born is there. Okay, but the potential there for itself is, is, is real. So where's the potential come from? Well, now here's the interesting idea. Go to the issue of the universe. Yes, there is a physical, non-living, or perhaps non-living universe that's there. Huh? And it seems to precede, certainly, Kepler's existence. I mean, Plato was before Kepler. So obviously, somebody was here before him. So since Plato was also looking at the planets, why would we say that Kepler invented the system? Well, because Kepler identified and discovered the physical, the physical principle by which that system was actually organized. And, and that is not only not trivial, you gotta realize that that may be the process by which nature itself discovers its principle of organization. We are making it, we, we, now I'm gonna be careful because I don't wanna go into what's called pantheism, and I also don't want to get into sort of this Elan Vital idea where I'm just saying, oh, we're just like the said the universe and we're sort of Gaia or something. That's not my point. My point to you is that human beings invent, create, advance, change, transform a universe in a way that never existed before. And that is probably our role in being here. And to that extent, we have to therefore have a, you know, both a humility and a sense of responsibility, uh, which I think is, um, is the best definition of what human identity would be. Well, Hold on, I'm, just, I'm, I'm sorry, just, I, we have one, one here, can we take this, and then we're gonna close, because we're pretty late. Um, and, and going all over in my mind with you, thrown out, I was reflecting back on the intervention I did two days ago, uh -huh. and uh, several times with people I was being informed of who it was I was about, the type of person I was about to engage, and I said, well, you know, I've been doing this a little bit, I, okay, I got it. You should tell them who it was, so people oh, don't, okay. don't know. Uh, Le Leslie, Leslie Gelb, uh, uh, head of or, or co-head co-chair of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, I went with Lynn Speed, and uh, so I'm ready for this. Then I walk and I experience it, and um, it was something out of like you know, uh, well, when this guy also uh, the ambassador to the United Nations of Iraq was there. And he starts this thing out by saying this is going to be a conversation, and it's set up that way. Um, yet, what proceeded to happen was the, the 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 master of the universe began to use, and he cooperated fully. This uh, 
Iraqi ambassador is, is kind of a, a whipping tool in a very casual, nonchalant, I mean, it was really something, right? And my point is that now I began to understand uh, in person, live, what they mean when you say you're dealing with one of the heads of the establishment and not some congressman or some, this was completely different. Now, Lynn Speed handled her part, her piece, because we organized ourselves as what we were going to do, more or less. And uh, while I've received congratulations from people, because it was all about how to get Gail to respond to certain things, some of what Lynn was saying and others of what the current history is. And that, and, and that worked. However, uh, seeing this play out, literally the room, I wasn't frightened, I wasn't intimidated, but the room began, got kind of blurry to me. My whole vision, I, I, because I, I couldn't quite believe, and even that's not the way to put it, I believed it, but this was kind of uh, a Hitchcock strange that I was watching. I'd never seen anything like this, the kind of the, the arrogance and audacity in a very calm, friendly manner about this guy. This is really wild stuff. So I got out what I got out, and we got the response, but from that moment I left that room, I haven't felt good about it. I feel like I got away with one. It worked. And in listening to what you're saying, I said, because I'm wondering, I said, well, you know, Lynn Speed has years of experience. She's been doing this for decades. She's got this together. No, she has this concept in mind that you're saying that I still don't have of what real, because that's how you rise above a guy like that. You have to understand these principles and concepts. That's when it's not that big a deal. At least that's what I'm sitting here wondering as you're, as this, as you're making your presentation, and I'm reflecting back on that. I, th I think it's different. I think it's different than you say, but I, I will give you an example of something that I know. I know from having spent both time with him and seen him in action. See, Lyndon LaRouche is different than most of us with respect to his view of the establishment. He actually literally like just detests these people. I mean, he, he just has a thing about them I don't mean he, and by the way, he doesn't have an obsession the way that, for example, frankly, colonials do. Look, Leslie Gelb just treated the guy like a sand nigger. Right. That's all. He just had the Iraqi ambassador and he treated him like a sand nigger. Because he could. Because that is one of the prerogatives of the Anglo-American establishment in particular. Now that doesn't mean, let me be very clear, that Leslie Gelb's actual evaluations were in any way either trivial or not important. They were very important. Matter of fact, what he said to you was extremely important. Because he said that Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, no, Qatar, uh, and he named uh, Oman, I guess, was wherever he named. He named a series of countries that were definitely financing. Oh, United Arab Emirates was another one. That's what it was. He also said, we know what's in the 28 pages. <laughs> well, he said, he said that the truth was going to come out. And he said that the pages were going to get released. And he said that it was undeniable that this had been going on for a long time. Hmm? So, so we have to differentiate. And this is, I think, one of the reasons that Lynn wants us to be so clear about these things. That, that in other words, it, you, you, you're, you're dealing with a situation in which a country, Gelb is the one that said that Obama should get rid of all of his cabinet. But he didn't say that Obama should get rid of Obama. <laughs> <laughs> That's our job. Right? But also, it's not our job. Our job is the alternative to all of this and the monstrosity and the character of evil that you, exhibit, that you, that you uh, experience. Sort of like the character of evil associated with the Roman Empire, in which at different times they were very intelligent people. Hmm? But, but what they were about, what was actually happening, what they were actually engaged in was evil. And they were unable to extricate themselves from it because of the method by which they sought to make policy and make change. And that's the difference. And I, I, don't, I wouldn't try to read the particulars because the intervention is an ensemble. The intervention wasn't just what you do versus what she does. No, we, we, we're doing it together. Right? It's one thing. So I, I don't think you have to read things that way. I think the more important and most important thing I'd just like to say to you is we've got 
a Hamilton project called the Manhattan Project. And we're going to make that work. And we'll make mistakes as we do it. We'll correct the mistakes as we go. And we'll improve. Okay, I think we better end now.